for my presentation, I thought of a, let's say, five parts structure. And I'll start by telling you how I got into this uh, uh, business, how I encountered the subject and how I started to work on. Um, so I'll start on a personal note. Uh, if you will allow uh, it, and then I'll move towards uh, questions regarding methodology. I think it's uh, very important, um, given the current uh, situation and the current stand, and as Professor Almes reminded at the beginning, the discussion is considering concerning Lucas's confessionalization. Was he a um, confession of faith? Was he or wasn't he uh, um, the author of a Calvinist confession of faith? Is he a saint? Is he a heretic? So the second part on method, I think, is very important. What's the perspective I'm speaking from? Then I will move to the uh, core uh, matter, let's say, the problem of the um, Reformation as uh, seen through uh, Lucaris' eyes and through the eyes of his um, uh, collaborators. And then uh, after briefly pointing out, uh, let's say, what I think is important about the character and about his times, uh, I will uh, address uh, briefly the question of uh, the canonization, which, as I will try to show, it's... Uh, dates from the 17th century already. So this is no uh, new issue, but I will try to, to present uh, a couple of uh, ideas about uh, this topic. So I'll start on a personal note and develop a bit on the method, then going to the core of the issue, which I think are the relationship between Lucaris and the Reformation. And I will uh, try to say a couple of words about the event in January, which uh, basically uh, triggered our meeting today. So it all started in uh, 2004 when I embarked in a PhD program in Paris, uh, PhD coordinated by uh, Professor Paolo Odorico. Uh, there was an issue with the subject I had proposed back then, it was too large and too ambitious. I was trying to tackle the entire 17th century, the whole Eastern and Southeastern Europe, from the point of view of the ecclesiastical uh, reforming currents. And Professor Odorico said this is a very uh, enthusiastic approach. However, this is not how it should be done. You need like a proper subject, uh, something to study in depth and not, you need a research question, or several research questions that you need to test. Therefore, he invited me to find the proper subject to study. And part of the invitation was to read more and to uh, travel more in order to, let's say, find the voice, find the topic. And one of the travels I uh, did was to Geneva. And in Geneva, there is this fantastic, fabulous, wonderful museum for the history of uh, the Reformation. It's, uh, it has just won a European prize. It's a very nice uh, museum. And it's a very difficult museum in the sense that Reformation was not always keen to the images. So they, there were parts of the reforming currents who really did not like images. So to work with images in a museum about the history of Reformation was not an easy task. So what they decided to do is operate on, on a more, let's say, symbolic level and try to convey to the audience, to, to the public, some general fundamental core ideas. So one of the rooms was dedicated to a core concept of uh, Protestantism, that is predestination. And that specific room uh, was, and still is, organized as a banquet of predestination. You have a table, as a visitor, you can uh, roam around the table, you can move. Uh, the participants to this banquet are on the walls in effigy, so the paintings represent the main reformed theologians who have expressed a position on predestination. And the chairs, as you can see, the chairs are not actually chairs, but the bottom of the chair is, uh, let's say, with glass ceiling, and one can see the books 
which the uh, reverends on the wall have issued on the matter. So you are invited to partake, to participate at this banquet. The, uh, in the, the head of the table, so the most important character which sits at the table is Jean Calvin, Calvin himself. And you can see him like in transparent uh, uh, form, um, basically running the, uh, the meeting. However, uh, what impressed me more than the gathering of this uh, serious uh, gentleman was the character which was represented nearby Calvin. So basically you have Calvin to the left of Calvin, the right of the, of the viewer. Uh, you had this magnificent painting, um, 6032, representing the Patriarch of Constantinople, Kyrillos Lucaris, being a gift to his friends in Geneva. So basically I was very, um, it made me curious, what is a Calvinist uh, like Calvin uh, doing with an Orthodox like Lucaris? Uh, and this decision of the curators of the museum triggered my curiosity. I uh, watched what was in the chair in front of the patriarch. So everyone had the book. So I wanted to see what is opened in, in front of the painting. And in front of the painting, it was opened a uh, confession of the Christian faith attributed to Kirillos, the Patriarch of Constantinople, published in Geneva in 1633. And it was open, of course, at the chapter where uh, the author of the uh, Confession of Faith uh, spoke about predestination in some very Calvinist terms. So I wanted to know more about this, uh, this character. I returned to um, uh, Paris and I told Professor Odorico that this is what I'd like to uh, to investigate, to see uh, what uh, what happened and uh, whether what this fascinating character uh, has to say. What Professor Odorico knew, and I was about to find out, is that uh, first of all there is a huge amount of literature on the topic because it, it is a very controversial character and it's a very important character. First of all, and second of all, because the positions on the topic are highly uh, radicalized and they were already from the 17th century. So either saint or heretic, either friend or foe, and this already uh, was uh, in place during the uh, lifetimes of Kirillos Lucaris. So there, this is not, not, not something new and the passing on of time just made the positions even more radical. To complicate the, uh, the situation was the fact that in uh, the summer, in June, uh, ancient style, uh, 6038, Lucaris had been executed by order of the Sultan, of the Ottoman Sultan. And this kind of automatically placed him in a very special category, that of, an, of a martyr for the faith. And with the emergence of national ideas in the 19th century, that made him a martyr of the Greek nation. So you have everything, a character that was considered either a saint or a heretic during his times, uh, and who was considered step by step as a martyr of the true faith, being executed by order of the Sultan, and then a martyr of the Greek nation. Very complicated to handle it. Uh, and uh, basically a, a very, uh, say, difficult task because the position I was in was a position of a historian. So I was trying, it was not a theological standpoint, it was not a confessional standpoint. So I didn't care very much um, about the topic from the position of an orthodox, let's say, more or less uh, uh, practicant, neither from the position of a theologian, but I was interested that from the perspective of, of a historian, which complicates the uh, equation because we always kind of manage to upset like kind of everybody who uh, um, looks at this, uh, at this issue. Furthermore, uh, because of this huge amount of literature and because of this conflictual uh, approach and their confessional approach, nationalistic approach and so on and so forth, uh, the patriarch also generated a lot of myths and one of the myths, for example, being the fact that he uh, had uh, allegedly authored a translation of the Quran into Latin. So 
just more layers to this uh, legendary uh, to this uh, legendary character. So I started to dig a bit and to see uh, what happened. And I discovered a fascinating character. Lucares was born in uh, 1570 in Crete. As such, he was Greek, but he also was a subject of the Venetian Empire because uh, Crete was at that time the pearl of the uh, Venetian uh, overseas uh, maritime um, uh, possessions. He is very proud of this, both of his family and of his birth. He claims to be from a very noble and prestigious family, which it was the case. His father was a priest, but the family had uh, roots uh, quite back in time, uh, but also of his position as Venetian subject. In one of his sermons, um, which he um, Prenun, pr pr pronounced in 1610 as Patriarch of Alexandria, he proudly says that Venice is our empire. So basically until late. This allowed him, first of all, access to a very good education. He was educated in Italy, in Venice, and then in Padova. Uh, and he was perfectly fluent both in Greek and also in Italian and Latin. A very, very good um, education uh, training that he had received uh, with one of the uh, most important Greek theologians of the time, was established in Venice back then, Maximus Margunios. He was also part of the entourage of one of his relatives, Meletios Pigas, Patriarch of Alexandria, and it was Pigas who, impressed by the qualities of his nephew, uh, sent him to uh, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth in 1594. He designs, he names Lukaris as a doctor who is sent to um, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth to help cure the um, diseases that Eastern Christianity, the representatives of Eastern Christianity in those lands were suffering so to bring help and already in uh, 1594 we see uh, Jan Potocki uh, offering a passport for Lviv to monk Kirill so he is there bringing letters from Meletios Pigas to the Orthodox Brotherhood in the city but also to Prince uh, uh, Konstantin uh, Vasilostroshki so we find him in Nostro we find him also in Vilnius as um, Archmandrit of the Holy Trinity Monastery in 1595, and we see him as head of the School of the Vilnius Brother Brotherhood one year later in 1596. However, these are, these are very, very complicated times, as you know better than me. These are the times of the Synod of Brest, and these are the times where the situation in the uh, kingdom is not very easy. So he travels back and forth, he serves as a representative of Pigas in the in the region, and uh, he is also uh, the uh, let's say uh, one of the representatives of the uh, Orthodox in the of the Patriarch uh, in the uh, Counter Synod held in Brest by the Orthodox as a response to the uh, to the uh, union um, take on the on the on the issue. He was forged. In these times, so Venetian born, uh, like Venetian in the sense that Venetian subject, uh, Cretan born, Venetian educated, trained in the fires of, of the confessional uh, strife of the late 16th century. He becomes Patriarch of Alexandria in 1601. He takes over Pigas, who is very pleased with him. So at the death of Pigas, he, uh, Lucaris takes over. And he will remain Patriarch of Alexandria for 19 years until 1620, when he became Patriarch of Constantinople, a position that he will uh, keep until his death, uh, with interruptions until his death, execution in June 1638. Fascinating, um, let's say, career of fascinating uh, qualities, linguistic and otherwise, and fascinating projects. He is associated with the founding of the first Greek printing press in Constantinople, which lasted for half a year, but still impressive uh, initiative and achievement. He was associated with the uh, refashioning of a patriarchal school in Constantinople. 
And he is also involved in several important projects, like, for example, translating the New Testament in simple spoken Greek. The translation was published in 1638 after his death in Geneva, and also in a very intense, started already in 1598, as far as we can say, activity of preaching in vernacular, so speaking a language that everyone can understand. However, this fascinating character uh, raised significant doubts because, as I uh, mentioned before, of the confession of faith that uh, was ascribed to him. As for the Quran, no, he did not uh, translate the Quran over it. So when I found all this, which were uh, quite known things for, for everybody, I said, okay, but how can I tackle this monster? This second monster, where, where do I fit in? And everyone who has to deal with Lucaris has to read uh, this book. Uh, the best book on the topic uh, until now, it, is, it was and it still is Gunnar Herring's um, um, phenomenal uh, contribution on the ecumenical uh, patriarchate and the European politics, 60, 20, 60, 38. Um, Herring saw an impressive amount of, uh, of documents and he produced this magnificent book. My purpose was not to replace Herring. My purpose was different. First of all, I asked different questions and then my methodology was different and my sources were a little bit different. So Herring uh, remains fundamental. What I wanted to see was first, uh, not as much as uh, Lucaris's implication in the period in the European conflict, the Thirty Years' War. I was more interested in the de definition of true faith, how the patriarch contributes to this, uh, to the response, responding to this fundamental question: What is an Eastern Christian? What is an Orthodox? And what is the answer he gives? Uh, what I tried to do was return to the archives. Herring saw many things, but one of the things he couldn't see because they were closed at the time were the archives of the uh, Holy Congregation for the Propagation of Faith, Propaganda Fide. So he couldn't work in there because they were closed at the time. And I said, this is a good opportunity now that the archive is open to see what's in there. As for the methodology, Herring did what many historians normally do. You have a subject, you have a question, then you gather all relevant material, main sources and secondary sources on the topic and try to make sense out of it. I decided to gather the material, but to listen to the voices that could be heard and were obvious in there. So I was very much interested not to put everything together and to find out the truth, like the big truth, but I wanted to know what each major participant in the affair had to say. What did Lucaris had to say about it? What did his opponents had to say about it? What did the Calvinists had to say about it? What languages did they use? What language, what concepts were they utilizing and how this changed over time. Because uh, looking through the archives, one can see uh, many, many things as I will try to, to show to you. So the Confession of Faith, uh, it has two versions. One Latin, 1629, which was published without, as you can see, without place of publishing. Uh, and uh, one in Greek, 6033, which you've seen at the beginning. The uh, first version, the Latin one, is not an autograph one, and it was not supposed to be published. We know this from the archival material. It was supposed to be a sign given to the friends in Geneva that the Church of the East, the Church of Constantinople, was closer uh, to them than it was to Rome. So basically, it's a very short text. It's made a lot of noise, but it's a very short text which basically was meant to showcase the um, affinities, the common points between the Church of the East and the, uh, uh, let's say, the um, um, Calvinist uh, churches. This uh, kind of, it was written in Latin, which is very indicative of the audience they had in mind. However, the text was published without the permission of Lucaris and without the permission of his, uh, let's say, of the, those who initiated it, because basically uh, there was too much enthusiasm and it was published uh, first in French translation and then in Latin in Geneva. He received the Genevan, the Genevan uh, version. It 
caused a lot of trouble and a lot of noise and basically everybody contested more or less contested it saying that why is a patriarch of constantinople writing in latin and so on and so forth so basically lucaris was asked by his friends in geneva to produce a version in greek and he does produce it in greek and this time uh, we have an orthograph so the question of the authorship is out of the question the confession is his and he also has authenticated several copies of this uh, of this uh, uh, confession of faith, and we know, um, let's say, presentation copy uh, offered to the king of uh, England. It's both bilingual, both Latin. It's bilingual, both Latin and 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 Greek. Uh, Vera identified the hand of the. Uh, Meletios Vlastos, or Meletios Vlastos as one of the copies of uh, of the text, it is authenticated by Lucaris is a gift uh, for the king. So my, uh, when reading upon this, and those were rather known facts, it, those are documents which exist in the archive, and basically they were known to, uh, to the scholars, it's just that this, let's say, confessional take, and this very uh, uh, harsh polemic that basically uh, did not uh, allow for some people to read the text properly. However, I was less interested in uh, saying like um, he wrote it or he didn't know, wrote it, but more in the context. Uh, why did he use some terms and not others? Why did he choose Latin and then switch to Greek? Uh, why did he uh, admit that the confession was his? Uh, at least on one public occasion, but never tried to have it confirmed by a synod of the Orthodox Church, which had never happened. And to analyze all the details and all the context on what led him to do this, and more specifically in these very complicated times in which he, uh, he was living in, it seemed to me more gratifying and productive than sweeping all this I'm quoting here from Dorothea Vandenburg, like an excellent uh, study, to, to, to uh, quote this as decline, as loss of identity, as uh, pseudomorphosis, and all concepts which you've heard mentioned also about, uh, for example, Piotr Mohila, and other very important uh, um, intellectuals and ecclesiastic personalities of the time. So I tried to switch a bit the, uh, the, uh, the take on the issue. And to see, when we speak about reformation, which is a term that they also used, but only in the Latin and the Italian texts, not in the Greek ones. When we speak about reformation, when they speak about reformation, what exactly did they understood by it? Uh, Kirillos is speaking and he is using the, both the Latin and the Italian terms. And he also claims that is impossible. He would do it, he would reform his church but God knows that this is impossible and this is like an outcome that will never happen. But if one looks at what he understands by reformation, he does not understand it in the sense of the Westerners. What he understands by it is a return to the apostolic faith. And what he thinks are interest, is interesting about what the, 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 uh, the uh, Lutherans or the, I'm using terms which are not confirmed, Please uh, excuse this. So it's not a Lutheran, it's evangelic, and it's not a, a Calvinist is reformed. I know this, but for simplifying, I will, uh, I will, I will I use, I'm using these terms. Uh, so basically, his take on the issue was very similar. He liked this kind of approach, return to the sources, return to the, uh, to the uh, Christianity uh, as it was at the beginnings. So it's more uh, restitutio. A restoration, restoration than that a reformation uh, in a proper sense of the term, and this can be seen in his printing projects. Uh, as I mentioned already, he is the founder of a printing press in Constantinople, and if one looks at the books he is printing, those books are not Calvinist; those books are not Lutheran, as his enemies label them. Those are books authored by, uh, mostly by, uh, let's say, Greek theologians who were adversaries of the church union. So most of the texts are directed against the, uh, the union of Florence and against the uh, primacy of Pope and against uh, the, uh, 
uh, everything that Rome uh, standed for. So it's uh, anti-Latin and that most, most of, more, 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 more importantly, an anti-Roman stance than a heretic uh, Calvinist stance on the topic. And this is proven not only by the fact that he's editing the uh, works of Meletius Pigas, for example, but also by the fact that one of the books uh, that it edited is the dossier of canonization of a saint, Erasimus Notaras. And to have an alleged Calvinist, the Calvinist as Lucaris, canonizing a saint, this is quite uh, ironical, let's say. And this is an irony, uh, which, however, the uh, adversaries of Lucaris did not uh, observe. Uh, this was not, of course, the take of his uh, friends in Geneva. For them, and for those in Leiden, and for those in England, and for his partners, uh, what happened, he was a pure Calvinist. And this is also the take that, for example, Herring is, is following in, in, in many points, uh, that for them, everything that we have seen, like the confession of faith, the fact that he's very anti-Roman in his stance, this is always proof that he is a pure Calvinist. And this is a quote from the English ambassador uh, in Constantinople, Sir Thomas Rowe. He is a pure Calvinist. He cannot say it because he's afraid to uh, get into open, but this is the case. My take on the topic uh, from all that I uh, told you and here, what you see is a project of a public library in Constantinople. My take on the topic is very different. He was not a Calvinist. He was not uh, reformed in the way that uh, his, uh, the Westerners saw him. The confession of faith had a different meaning for him. Uh, what he wanted to do uh, was to uh, put into place a different agenda. And I call this the reformation in the shadow of reformation. We have uh, especially ecclesiastic uh, representatives, but not only. Uh, they can also be laymen. Uh, Eastern Christians who understand that there are significant problems to which their communities are confronted. And this people are trying to, in different ways, are trying to find solutions for the problems they are encountering. I call this the Reformation in the Shadow of Reformation, and one of the representatives, in my opinion, is Piotr Mohila, a man who tries to identify the problems, or he already identified them, others did, the problems uh, with uh, which uh, his community uh, was confronted and to find solutions to these problems. Now, because of their training and because of the times, some of the uh, solutions were inspired by Latin theological works or by uh, evangelical or by Lutheran uh, reformed uh, uh, works, but they are not identical. And in my opinion, one, one should not, the connections that these people had either with Rome or with the representatives of the Protestant churches, should not overshadow and should not be identified as uh, something that it was uh, not. So in my opinion, he was neither a saint nor a heretic, uh, nor an opportunistic Greek. This is how his uh, former Armenian friends and Hugo Grotius are quoting him. He published the Confession of Faith because he's an opportunist and he got money for this. No, he had, in my opinion, a project, a project which uh, led him, for example, to... Uh, move towards, uh, to work towards a huge political and military alliance against Poland and against Catholic state, which involved the Ottoman Empire, uh, Muscovy, uh, Sweden, Protestant states of Western Europe. So even the, uh, let's say, military uh, aspect of it was considered, but this is part of a bigger a project uh, that he had, and this bigger project that he had was uh, the salvation of his uh, community and of his uh, soul. And now, briefly, uh, this is about my story, how I got there, and uh, what I see uh, as being the case in this. Uh, the decision in January of the Holy Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarchate to canonize uh, Kirillos, together with Kirillos the Sixth. The patriarch, which was who was executed by the Ottomans in 1821, so the Greek Revolution, um, it's the last installment in the series. Uh, Lucaris uh, had been declared hieromartyr, 
and the saint of the Orthodox Church already in 2009 by the Holy Synod of the Alexandrian Patriarchate. Um, Kirillos VI was uh, also um, recognized in passing, be said, as a saint by the Church of Greece in 1993. So, but this and the Lucaris' case goes even further. Uh, immediately after his death, and the text was recently uh, published by uh, a Greek theologian, um, there was an attempt of canonizing Lucaris. He was declared as a saint by his uh, friends and by his uh, uh, those which were close to him. Uh, because his successor, Kirillos Kondaris, was blamed, was considered responsible for uh, Kirillos Lucaris' death, the church, the communities in Crete refused to uh, pay uh, respect to mention the name of the Patriarch of Constantinople in, uh, in the prayers and in the, um, in the, uh, the liturgy. So basically it was a short, small schism. It took several years uh, for the uh, new Patriarch of Constantinople to, uh, to negotiate and to solve this very uh, serious and very difficult issue. However, at the same time, Rome attempted to canonize Kirillos Kondaris, so the successor of Lucaris. And this is a project that dates from 6041, 6042. And we have the papers and it's a fascinating attempt. To my mind, this is the only moment in which Rome um, attempted to uh, sanctify a patriarch of Constantinople, Kondaris being also uh, killed by the Ottomans in Tunis. So we have the papers. Uh, this to give you the idea, and with this I'm closing, that making the saint uh, was and never is, uh, let's say, an easy task, neither an easy task, nor in our parts of the world, an um, inoffensive uh, task. It always comes uh, with um, something deep attached to it. I hope this can form the basis for a discussion and thank you all for the patience and for the interest.